This session is on an extremely important question, which is the question of imperialism. Now, comrades who have followed world events over the last few years, they'll know that this subject is essential to understand and grasp. From the war in Ukraine to the genocide in Gaza, to the rising competition between US and Chinese imperialism, imperialism really dominates the world today. But I would say that a Marxist understanding of imperialism, that's not just a recognition of rivalries and competition. Lenin had a method of studying imperialism, and it based itself on a scientific method, um, looking more deeply at the causes and characteristics of the epoch. My comrades might know that Lenin published a book of the same name, Imperialism, and I'd just like to plug that book. We'll be selling it in the, in the stall by the hotel, but for everyone watching at home, you can buy it as well, buy a bookstore, well-read books. And if you've not read this vital work, I hope that this session will inspire you to do so. Now, Lenin's analysis have proven to be true by the last hundred years of history. But like all phenomena, it's not a static, immutable thing. It's, uh, it changes. And that's why we're having this session today, to study imperialism concretely in our own time. And to lead off on this subject, um, we have the pleasure of introducing John Peterson. John, he's the editor-in-chief of uh, the newspaper of our, Amer our American section, The Communist. And after John's lead-off, we'll proceed to a break. And then after the break, comrades can come in for, for discussion. But without further ado, I'd like to just give the word to John. Thanks. Well, good morning, comrades. Especially to the comrades uh, watching from their workplace. Uh, the question of uh, imperialism, it really is a vast subject. And it really penetrates virtually every aspect of modern life. It's what lies behind the proxy war between U.S. Uh, and Russian imperialism in Ukraine, behind Israel's genocidal slaughter in Gaza, and it's what's driving millions of people to become communists today. So it's, a, it's essential that we have a, a really deep and nuanced understanding of it. It's not enough to know that it's the foreign policy continuation of capitalist domestic policy, which arises at a certain stage of capitalist development. And there's more to it than, than conquest, military conquest, and competing spheres of influence. It's the mortal enemy of the working class, and it's what the workers of the world and the RCI are going to bury in this century. So the purpose of this discussion isn't just to analyze it in the abstract, theoretically, but to understand our class enemy in order to overthrow it. Now, as we've been discussing this week, the relative stability of the post-war period, when U.S. imperialism was counterbalanced by Russian Stalinism, is finished. Now, according to the risk analysts at Verisk Maplecroft, it's an, an analyst uh, <laughs> company, uh, uh, in 2024, this is their perspectives document, basically, in 2024, the global risk landscape will remain locked in a process of sweeping realignment that is amplifying a complex set of systemic risks that are increasingly transcending borders and sectors. Now, number one of their top 10 list of themes to watch this year is what they call geoeconomic fragmentation. Now, that's a, that's a fancy word for rising protectionism. <laughs> and for the a reversal of uh, global economic integration, or as, as some people have called it, it's slobalization. Slow. Uh, anyway, and this is a process that has accelerated over the last decade, and it's having a very clear impact on foreign direct investment, which is part of the lifeblood of, of capitalist globalization. According to the World Bank, this process of unraveling encompasses different channels including trade, capital, and migration flows. Now, by some estimates, FDI fell by 12% in 2022, and by, by another 7% in 2023, and it remains below pre-pandemic levels. And there have also been significant shifts in where this FDI is being sent. And the reason is simple. Capitalists invest to make money, not for fun. And if the risk is too high or the profits are too low, they'll look for safer or more profitable alternatives. So, so this question of the flow and export of capital and, and the weaponization of trade is, is essential if we want to understand imperialism. Because, because when most people think of imperialism, they think of war and missiles and aircraft carriers, and that's certainly part of it. 
But in the final analysis, as Marx explained, it's the economic relations that d determine the main parameters of society. And although there is a dialectical interrelationship between many moving parts, it's the contradictions built into the capitalist economy that lie behind the rising instability, the class struggle, and the intensification of inter-imperialist rivalries. And as, as Lenin pointed out, it's through finance capital, not overt military might, that imperialism dominates most of the planet in the day in and day out of our, of our lives. Now, military power is ultimately a function of economic power. It's also a question of the class balance of forces. Because as Lenin said, uh, politics is a concentrated expression of economics. And I think we can add to that that uh, economics is a concentrated expression of the class struggle. And of course, foreign policy is an extension of domestic policy and vice versa. And just as individual capitalists are compelled on pain of extinction to expand their capital, every imperialist state does the same for its collective national capitalists on the world arena. And just as, we, just as we see the rise, fall, and, and, and endless changing of places of the petty bourgeois and the big bourgeois, with some companies growing into juggernauts, and other very well-known companies falling into ruin, there are imperialists, big and small, and there's a constant shifting uh, in the balance of power between them. Now, sometimes this happens without too much disruption. Other times, it leads to all-out war. But the point is that in the epoch of imperialism, it's all about defending private property of the means of production and expanding the reach of capital by any means necessary, whether that's through alliances, treaties, uh, embargoes, invasions, occupations, annexations. The human cost doesn't matter. And all serious imperialists understand this. This is what Lord Palmerston had in mind when he said, Lord Palmerston famously said, uh, we have no eternal allies and we have no perpetual enemies. Our interests are eternal and perpetual and those interests it is our duty to follow. Now, during the US occupation of Cuba at the beginning of the 20th century, the, the military governor, he saw the question of political stability on the island as a function of business confidence. As he wrote the Secretary of War, when money can be borrowed at a reasonable rate of interest, and when capital is willing to invest in the island, a condition of stability will have been reached. On the other side, you have a, a, a former US Army general named Smedley Butler, who, be, who became an anti-war activist. And this was his take on his role while he was in the, in the military. He said, I helped make Mexico safe for American oil interests in 1914. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar interests in 1916. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. Now, as Marx explained, uh, the executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. And as Engels added, it's the bodies of armed men of the state, including the police and the military, who enforce those common affairs at home and abroad. And it's the defense of those interests that lies behind the brutality, the racism, the horror without end that fills us all with a burning hatred for capitalism. So to make sense of this world we live in, we have to start with a theoretical understanding of imperialism. And I think it's also useful to have some historical context for how we got to where we are today. So let's uh, establish a baseline by briefly reviewing Lenin's understanding of the question. Now, his writings on war and imperialism really are essential reading for all Marxists. We have a new book on this question as well. Uh, but his, his main work on imperialism, which was written in 1916, was really a watershed for Marxists. And he counterposed, uh, modern, he, he, he counterposed modern capitalist imperialism to the imperialism of the ancient world. And although he emphasized that, you know, no definition should be treated like a checklist, valid for all time, he did identify five key features for understanding what he called the highest stage of capitalism. First, you have the concentration of production and capital has developed to such a high degree 
that it has created monopolies which play a decisive role in economic life. Second is the merging of banking capital and industrial capital into finance capital, which leads to the emergence of a financial oligarchy with immense power over the, over the economy and it's fused closely with the state. Third is the rising importance of the export of capital as distinguished from the export of commodities. And this creates an international network of dependence on finance capital, which spreads its tentacles all over the world, uh, especially through its banking system. So fourth is the formation of international monopolist capitalist associations, which share the world among them, amongst themselves. And finally, you have the territorial division of the planet among the biggest capitalist powers, who all want spheres of influence, sources of raw materials, cheap labor, and, and markets to export commodities and capital. So Lenin's conclusion after, after this analysis was that the 20th century marks the turning point from the old capitalism to the new, from the domination of capital in general to the domination of finance capital. Capitalism has been transformed into imperialism. But he added, that imperialism is the eve of the social revolution of the proletariat. And that's why, despite this hellscape that humanity is passing through, the RCI is filled with revolutionary optimism for the future, because all of this is, is only preparing the objective conditions for the transition to a higher stage of human society. Now, not too long ago, we were supposed to believe that war was an abnormality. It was a disruption of normal, peaceful capitalism, a necessary evil when human rights and democracy were under threat. <laughs> but far from the Pax Americana that we were promised after the fall of the Soviet Union, by at least one estimate, there are 110 armed conflicts raging around the world, from Congo to Sudan to Myanmar. Now, the, the prospect of an all-out world war is highly unlikely at the present time, this is due in part to the deterrent effect of nuclear weapons, but above all to the class balance of forces, which is overwhelmingly in favor of the working class, who have no interest in a repeat of World, uh, world War I or World War II. But even small wars are absolutely disastrous for the people that are caught up in them. As of last year, more than 114 million people have been forcibly displaced worldwide as a result of crisis and war the highest levels on record. So this new normality of war and displacement, it's really just a return to the old capitalist normality on a higher and even more devastating level. So who benefits from all this suffering? Well, arms manufacturing and exports is big business, and it's fused closely with the state. Now, when a country like the US gives weapons to another country, it's usually in the form of loans that can only be used to buy weapons from the country making the loan. And there are huge built-in profits for the private arms manufacturers. In 2023 alone, just one company, Lockheed Martin, raked in nearly $8.5 billion in profits, which is equivalent to the GDP of Togo, which is a country of nearly 9 million people. Now, the current US military budget is $877 billion. But, but in practice, over $2 trillion is allocated to the Department of Defense, which is nearly 15% of the U.S. federal budget. Now, the, the U.S. spends more than, twice on it, uh, tw more than twice as much on its military as all other NATO members combined. And, and as, the, as the crisis of capitalism deepens and instability and tensions rise, there's a new arms race and a revival of militarism including countries like Germany and Japan. So total global military expenditure in 2023 reached a record high of $2.44 trillion, molto, molto, which was a 6.8% increase from the year before. Now, all of this is a colossal waste of resources that could instead be used to improve the whole of humanity. As, as Ted Grant once put it, Vast amounts of money are being squandered every year on arms expenditure, which under modern conditions is mainly the production of expensive scrap metal. Now, before we look at uh, the relative decline of U.S. imperialism, 
Let's quickly review its meteoric rise. It started with the first American Revolution, which was the first successful war of colonial liberation against what was then the biggest imperialist power on the planet. And it established the US as the only real power on a vast continent that was rich in natural resources. In 1803, the US nearly doubled in size when it bought the Louisiana Territory from Napoleon. And in 1823, it issued the Monroe Doctrine, which rejected further colonization or intervention by European powers and effectively claimed the Western Hemisphere as its backyard. In 1846, it annexed Texas, the state of Texas, which had declared its independence from Mexico, which led to what many people called a wicked war with Mexico. And uh, once the war was over, the United States bought half of Mexico for $15 million, which is a pretty good deal, considering that California alone uh, has a GDP of $3 trillion, which is more than double the entire GDP of Mexico. Uh, then came the second American Revolution, the Civil War, uh, and this really laid the basis for the unfettered flourishing of capitalism and industrialization. From the expansive commercialization of agriculture, the establishment of a national banking system, uh, a vast network of roads, railroads, ports, canals, and huge advances in military technology, which only intensified after the war, where you had the, the tragic abortion of Reconstruction in the South, aggressive westward expansion into lands that were still occupied by indigenous populations, and the purchase of Alaska from Russia uh, in 1867. And this, this industrialization was heavily backed by state intervention, and the economy accelerated at previously unimaginable rates. In just 30 years, from 1860 to 1890, US GDP quintupled five times. Uh, and, and went from about $12 billion to over $60 billion. By comparison, the GDP of the UK in 1890 was less than $11 billion. And I think that clearly illustrates the economic basis for the ascent of US imperialism and the eventual decline of British imperialism. Of course, a powerful working class was also forged, and there were many inspiring and heroic class battles but the territorial limits of this expansion on the continent were, were eventually reached. And inevitably, the US wanted its own overseas colonies. Never mind that the Europeans had already carved everything up. Because as Lenin explained in his, in his work on imperialism, just because the world has been divided, doesn't mean it can't be redivided if the balance of forces changes. So in 1898, the hawks in the US administration, the pro-war wing, <laughs> picked the fight with, uh, with the decaying Spanish Empire. And after a few months of fighting, it had defeated Spain and taken possession of the Philippines, Guam, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. Now, before 1898, there were very few references in the media or in, in politicians' speeches to, uh, to, uh, to the, the word America. The country was referred to as the United States. But after 1898, with all these new colonies, they started talking of a greater America, or even imperial America. Now, Cuba formally gained its independence from the US in 1902, but as we know, it remained a de facto colony until 1959, many decades later. And even today, the US has, a, has a eight, oh, nearly 9,000 soldiers, uh, a prison camp, and a McDonald's in Guantanamo. Now, the Philippines was brutally occupied until 1946, and, and to this day, uh, uh, Puerto Rico and Guam are unincorporated territories of the United States. For good measure, uh, the US also annexed the islands of Hawaii in 1898. Hawaii. Uh, and so this brings us to the, the beginning of the 20th century, which again is what Lenin identified as the tipping point for full-fledged capitalist imperialism. <clears throat> so in 1904, Teddy Roosevelt, President Teddy Roosevelt, announced the Roosevelt Corollary uh, as an update to the Monroe Doctrine. Not only were they against uh, foreign intervention, European intervention in the Americas, now he said that the US had not only the right, but the duty to intervene in the affairs of Latin America and the Caribbean to defend US investments and in infrastructure and political stability. 
And this was known as gunboat diplomacy, and it saw dozens of military interventions and occupations throughout the region. And as Roosevelt uh, put it, speak softly and carry a big stick. Uh, and this was the epoch of the building of the Panama Canal and the so-called Banana Wars to defend the interests of the United Fruit Company. But it was the dollar diplomacy, as they called it, which followed, that really leveraged the, the economic power of U.S. imperialism. Now, with World War I and the presidency of Woodrow Wilson, uh, the U.S. began to position itself as the, the world's dominant power, and its economy continued to grow very impressively. During what they called the Roaring Twenties, uh, GDP grew by 42%, but this was followed by the Great Depression and the pre-revolutionary radicalization of the working class. Now, Teddy Roosevelt's cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, successfully cut across that revolutionary mood by getting the U.S. directly involved in the war with Japan and Germany. And it was World War II that really launched the U.S. into the imperialist stratosphere. And, and here's a key fact. Over 16 million Americans served in the U.S. military during World War II but only one in 10 actually saw combat. This is how one writer put it. He said that the US military during World War II was first and foremost an unfathomable network of typists and file clerks. Secondarily, a, stupend a stupendous mechanism for moving stuff from one part of the world to another. And last and least, a fighting organization. And through this network that it built up, but by the end of the war, U.S. imperialism had embedded itself everywhere, including, in, including into the very fabric of, of uh, you know, the formerly dominant European empires, including the British. Now remember, in the 1920s and 30s, Trotsky didn't rule out open war between the U.S. and Britain as the U.S. rose and the British tried to defend what they had. In the end, this transition between the dominance of one imperialism and the other took place without a direct confrontation between the two. So at first, uh, and, and, and I'll explain a little bit about how that happened. So at first, the US was formally neutral in the war. The, the national mood was isolationist, and there was, and there was legislation that banned it from uh, selling arms or offering credits to any of the warring nations. But in, in 1940, during the Blitz, they came up with the Destroyers for Bases Agreement, uh, um, destroyers, bay, ships, naval ships, yeah? And so, which, which provided the UK with 50 naval destroyers, these battleships, for the low, low price of, of 99 year leases to set up American bases in British uh, areas like Newfoundland, the Bahamas, Jamaica, where, the, Newfoundland, uh, where, where the US could fly its flag, confiscate property, build whatever it wanted, and its workers and soldiers were exempted from British taxes and laws. Then came the Lend-Lease program, Lend -Lease, which supplied the Allies, including the Russians, with, with $50 billion worth of food, oil, trucks, ships, planes, etc. So to, to paraphrase, paraphrase Marx, it was the almighty dollar, which was the heavy artillery, used by US imperialism to, to batter down all the Chinese walls. So during the four years that the U.S. was involved in the war, it set up 30,000 installations at over 2,000 bases worldwide. <clears throat> in, in Panama alone, it had 134 bases, not including the canal zone itself. <clears throat> Millions of troops were sent to Europe. They brought with them their food, their music, their sports. Over two million passed through Britain alone, including my grandfather, my great uncle, and Alan Woods' father. And as the Brits used to say, there are only three things wrong with the, with the Americans. They were overpaid, oversexed, and over here. <laughs> and by the end of the war, Churchill grudgingly noted that the war had brought the US to the summit of the world. In 1945, the US produced more commodities, had more oil, more gold, more planes, more bases, more ships, than pretty much all other countries combined. Not to mention a brief monopoly on atomic weapons. So American imperialism seemed poised to take direct possession of huge parts of the world. Uh, the overseas areas under US jurisdiction included 135 million people. 
which is more than lived on the U.S. mainland. So its, it's troops were everywhere. Its industrial base was intact. Its economy was in overdrive. And there was talk not only of making Alaska and Hawaii into states, but they even talked about the, making the Philippines a state, Iceland, uh, possibly even France and Japan. Uh, it was like 1898 on steroids. But of course, several factors cut across this. First and foremost, the class struggle. Now, as the war wound down, the, the fires of revolution burned everywhere. Hundreds of millions of people rose up against colonial slavery. As one American general put it, Asia was an enormous pot seething and boiling. Now in 1940, nearly one in every three people living on the planet was directly colonized. By 1965, it was just one in 50 people. And I think that gives you an, an indication of the colossal power of the masses, even when their struggles were hijacked by reformists and Stalinists. But, but not only that, the US military was also infected with the spirit of rebellion. Millions had been mobilized to fight against fascism for freedom. And now that the war was over, they wanted to go home. They had no interest in fighting to establish new colonies or to hold old ones. It had taken them years to get the nearly 8 million troops that were stationed everywhere uh, in their positions. And now not only did they, did they need to get them all home, but th they wanted to keep 2.5 million soldiers in uniform. According to the Army Chief of Staff, we are now concerned with the peace of the entire world and the peace can only be maintained by the strong. But what resulted was the biggest mutiny in American military history. There were mass protests across Asia, Europe, and in the US. 20,000 uh, American soldiers marched on Manila, saying the Filipinos are our allies. We ain't gonna fight them. In Guam, they burnt, they burnt an effigy of the Secretary of War, an African-American unit stationed in, in Burma, an African-American uh, uh, unit of soldiers in Burma, Burma yeah. in, now it's Myanmar, yeah. uh, they said, they wrote the president and said they were disgusted with undemocratic American foreign policy. We do not want to unify China with bayonets and bombing plans. They were well aware that back home they didn't even have the same rights as white Americans. A and communists were actively involved in all of this agitation, which according to the authorities, had a destructive effect on soldiers' and civilians' morale. <laughs> so by June 1947, there was only a, a million U.S. soldiers uh, in uniform. And this all coincided with the biggest strike wave in U.S. history. In 1945, there were nearly 5,000 work stoppages, followed by even more in 1946, involv involving 4.6 million workers, and wages were the main issue. After years of rationing and, and, uh, and, and no-strike clauses that were imposed by the Labour and Communist Party leaders, there were huge strikes in coal mining, railroads, steel. And so there was no way that the U.S. imperialism could hold all these lands that they had. But that doesn't mean that they didn't plan on dominating the planet. During the war, they'd come to realize that they didn't need to physically occupy places to control them. With the logistical networks that they had built up, all they needed was a few hundred bases, some of them on remote islands, from which they could control the, the economic hubs of the, of, the, of the global economy. And with their strong position in, in world banking, they could, they could use all of this to dictate the terms of trade and the flows of, of currency and capital. The, Breton, the Breton Woods system established in 1944 basically made the US the world's reserve uh, currency. And although it fell apart in, in, in uh, the 1970s, to this day, 37 countries and territories use the US dollar as their official currency. 1944 also saw the establishment of the IMF and the World Bank, which are also used to dominate. And then you had the Marshall Plan after the war, with the equivalent of 173 billion in modern dollars sent to Western Europe to help rebuild after the war. And this was specifically aimed at countering the Soviet Union. Uh, and, and again, these were loans, not gifts. And the money had to be used to buy everything from US producers. Now, during the war, the US had been cut off from, from the tropics, the, from big parts of the world. And so they'd, ha they'd had to revolutionize uh, many aspects of production in order to, to survive, basically. So again, with heavy state intervention, 
There was a massive push to standardize parts and compatibility across industries. There, there were huge advances in chemistry and synthetics, things like rubber, uh, plastics, explosives, fertilizers, medicines, pesticides, and so on. And by 1946, US, the U.S. accounted for 60% of world in, uh, industrial production. And that was, the, that was the objective basis that really drew the rest of the world into the gravitational pull of the U.S. economy. But it deepened its grip on the world in other ways as well, from Hollywood and, and the music industry to a little thing called the Internet and the adoption of English as the de facto lingua franca for the world. And let's not forget Coca-Cola, the black waters of imperialism, as many call it in Latin America, or black water as well. The private mercenary group that, that uh, caused a little trouble in Afghanistan and Iraq. Or even more importantly, BlackRock, which is the world's biggest investment management company. And as Lenin explained in imperialism, financial institutions like this, they control huge parts of the economy well beyond their own market capitalization. It's like a giant pyramid of economic control. So BlackRock only has $113 billion in assets. But with that, it manages $10 trillion in assets around the world. But, but make no mistake about it, uh, a physical and military presence remains a key part of U.S. imperialism. It still has more, uh, around 800 bases around the world, three times more than in any other country. Uh, it has 11 nuclear-powered aircraft carriers, which are like floating air bases that can go anywhere. And about 4 million people still live in U.S. colonies, in Guam, Samoa, the Northern Marianas, and what they nicely call the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Now, Okinawa was returned to Japan in 1972, but 20% of the island is still a U.S. military base. 25% uh, of Guam is a U.S. military base. And as an added bonus, uh, big name clothing companies, clothing companies, they, they operate uh, sweatshops there using low-wage immigrant labor, because everything made there is technically made in the USA. Same goes for Puerto Rico, which is also forced to, to, to host US military facilities. And although, and although the Philippines got independence in 1946, it was forced to grant several you know, military bases with 99-year leases. And with the rising tension in the South China Sea, they've actually increased the bases now from five to nine. So, so much for national sovereignty. So all, all told, the U.S. has been involved in about 400 military interventions since 1776. And that doesn't even include the, the innumerable coups, assassinations, sanctions, sabotage, embargoes that it has orchestrated and imposed all around the world. But of course, nothing lasts forever. Everything eventually turns into its opposite. And I don't have time to go into it now, but the Vietnam War was a, was a major turning point. The 1970s was a period of economic uh, and social crisis. But after the fall of the Soviet Union, the U.S. got a, a new lease on life. It went on an all-out offensive against the working class. It aggressively encroached on former Soviet territory. But its defeats in the so-called war on terror in Iraq and Afghanistan have again exposed it as a colossus with feet of clay. Now it's being humiliated in Ukraine, and its support for Israel is blown up in its face. And I, I think we, we'd agree that Russia's imperialist resurgence and the shifting balance of forces in the Middle East, those are significant developments. But the most important change in the last period has been the rise of China. For decades, it was seen by the imperialists as a source of cheap labor, as a giant maquiladora to uh, assemble goods and undercut competitors while, evading, while avoiding uh, labor and environmental regulations. But as Lenin explained, the export of capital breeds capitalism in the countries where it's exported to. And we've, we've explained how China used the bureaucratically deformed worker state and the, and, the, and the core sectors of the planned economy as a springboard for the relatively cold restoration of capitalism and its development into a powerful imperialist country. China isn't making cheap plastic toys anymore. Well, they probably are, but they're doing a lot more than that too. Now remember, after World War II, the U.S. accounted for 50% of GDP. And although China was the biggest country in population, it only accounted for 5% of GDP. Now, there's different estimates, but, but today, uh, the U.S. has fallen to about 26% of GDP. And China has risen to 
So the U.S. still has extremely high output per capita, but that's a significant fall in its global footprint, if you will. China is now number two when it comes to FDI. It's the biggest exporter of capital to Africa. And again, all of this is a huge change from the situation a couple of decades ago. And illustrates, again, the, the objective basis for this relative U.S. decline and, and the rise of China. You can, you can see this in Fortune's list of the biggest global companies by revenue. In the top 10 today, you have five American companies, but also three Chinese, one Saudi, and one British Dutch. Of the five largest banks in the world ranked by market capitalization, three are American and two are Chinese. And when, if you rank the banks by their assets, the top four are all Chinese, and the fifth is Japanese. Now, that's not what the world looked like in 1945, and it's not what the world looked like in 2005. In fact, in 2005, the top five banks by assets were all European. Now, I think we all know that green energy, artificial intelligence, 5G, quantum computing, that's the future. And according to Foreign Affairs magazine, China wants to dominate new technologies, exploit U.S. dependencies, and export its excess industrial capacity to put competitors out of business. Take electric vehicles as an example. There is this lame little company called BYD that, that Elon Musk just mocked not too long ago. But it's now overtaken Tesla as the world's biggest seller of electric vehicles. It surpassed Volkswagen as the top seller of cars within the world's biggest market, China. And its, its new hybrid cars cost half as much and drive twice as long as, as their next competitor, Toyota. So now it's the Chinese capitalists and their state who are battering down the walls with, their, with the export of commodities. And while the U.S. just sent you know, tens of billions of dollars to Israel and Ukraine, China just announced a $47.5 billion investment, not in weapons to someone else, but in the semiconductor industry, where it plans to be the leader by, by 2030. And of course, it has a slight interest in Taiwan, which currently makes 90% of those advanced chips. Or take an old school industry like shipping. In 1975, the US was ranked number one in global capacity. Now the US is in 19th place, and last year, China produced a thousand, more than a thousand ocean-going vessels, while the U.S. produced 10. And this has big implications beyond commercial shipping, because more than 90% of military equipment travels by sea, mostly on privately contracted commercial cargo vessels. So all countries, and especially the main imperialist countries, they want, they want to export not only capital, but also crisis, class struggle unemployment, and discontent. And Biden is under pressure not to lose more American manufacturing jobs. This is a key political question. Uh, about two million jobs were lost in the early 2000s to what they call the China shock. A and now you have a situation where millions of American workers in the Rust Belt are, are angry at the Democrats and they think the Republicans are a working class party. So again, this is a clear example of how the national and the international the economic and the political, are all interconnected. And you can't uh, disconnect economies or the social contradictions that flow from the, the contradictions of capitalism. So Biden has actually intensified Trump's America first protectionist measures, striking blows against not only China, but also Europe. And so with China's economy slowing down, the entire world is, is, is in this desperate struggle to get as much as possible out of the world while avoiding the contradictions and explosions of their own class struggle. So they have to kind of dance around each other, maneuvering for an advantage as both collaborators and rivals. <coughs> this is clearly the case with the US and China in the Pacific, for example, but it's not always clear where the red lines lie that could lead to open conflict. <coughs> as it happens, China now has the world's largest active duty military, over two million troops. They have sophisticated weaponry and have already launched one nuclear aircraft carrier. The Chinese Navy has more ships than the U.S. Navy, and they're mostly concentrated in the Pacific while the U.S. fleet is spread out all over the world. And while it only has one official military base abroad in Djibouti, it's actively seeking access elsewhere, including places like Cuba.
So they've taken a page out of the playbook of U.S. imperialism after World War II, and, and they now operate uh, ports and terminals at over 100 locations in 50 different countries in what they call the Maritime Silk Road as part of their Belt and Road Initiative. It's even made huge in, in, uh, inroads into America's backyard of Latin America. A couple of years ago, the former head of the U.S. Southern Command said, we are losing our positional advantage in the Western Hemisphere, and immediate action is needed to reverse this trend. And the U.S. itself has been targeted, not just through Huawei or TikTok, but it's, uh, it's uh, China's shipping conglomerate, Costco, operates terminals at some of the biggest, most important U.S. ports like Los Angeles. Now, to deal with this, the U.S. has been trying to pivot to Asia to get out of the Middle East and Europe, but it keeps getting sucked into those regions. And it's because it's, it's not so easy to be the world's policeman in an epoch of decline and crisis and revolution. Now, for several decades, U.S. military doctrine was based on what they called the two-war construct, which basically said that they should have enough forces to fight two major wars in two different parts of the planet. But by the, early two, by the early 2000s, 2010s, they had to acknowledge that one major war is all they can handle. And even then, you've seen how, uh, you know, how, what they've done to avoid getting stuck into a direct confrontation with Russia, which they might not be able to win. As, uh, as, as a top uh, U.S. senator recently said, America's military is not prepared for war or peace. I mean, just look what happened in Afghanistan. After spending $2.3 trillion dollars and sending as many as 100,000 troops at a time in the longest war U.S. imperialism has ever been involved in. <clears throat> After they claimed they learned the lessons of Vietnam, they had a humiliating withdrawal and everything collapsed overnight. Or look at countries like Turkey or Israel or even Saudi Arabia. All these little gangsters trying to get away with as much as they can because the godfather is distracted elsewhere. <clears throat> it's also a question of confidence. <clears throat> After Ukraine, can Taiwan or the Philippines or Indonesia or even Japan or Australia be sure that the U.S. will defend them militarily if, if things heat up with China? So while the U.S. is still clearly the dominant power on the planet as a whole, it's not necessarily dominant in every, uh, you know, in every particular part of the planet. <coughs> now, another part of China's strategy <coughs> is the BRICS, which now accounts for 30% of world GDP, and 45% of the world population. They've even talked about creating a BRICS currency for trade between the BRICS countries. And uh, according, to foreign according to Foreign Policy magazine, de-dollarization's moment might finally be here. Uh, now, an aging, wounded lion can be just as dangerous as a young and healthy one. And, le and let's not forget that, that China's leaders are sitting on the dynamite of the world's largest working class. <clears throat> American workers are beginning to move into action. And, and there's a serious crisis in military recruitment. Only 9% of Americans aged 16 to 21 say they would even consider joining the military. So we can ex expect very turbulent times ahead. The CIA is worried. The director recently said, China's rise in Russia's revanchism pose daunting geopolitical challenges in a world of intense strategic competition in which the United States no longer enjoys uncontested primacy, and in which existential climate threats are mounting. That's a pretty bleak, pretty bleak outlook. <clears throat> so needless to say, U.S. imperialism is in uncharted waters. And if Trump wins again, all bets are off, even for key institutions like NATO. Remember what, 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 uh, what uh, Trump said immediately after the invasion of Ukraine. He said, this is genius. Oh, that's wonderful. You, you got to say that's pretty savvy. <laughs> Putin's a genius for invading Ukraine. And he has said that if NATO members don't pay their fair share, he'll encourage the Russians to do whatever the hell they want to them. <laughs> so the nation state and the market economy based on private ownership of the means of production are the main barriers to human progress. Imperialism tries to overcome this by, by extending its power and influence beyond its national borders through the export of capital and military force. But like the expansion of the market through credit, <clears throat> this can only go so far. And no country or politician can square the circle of the organic contradictions of capitalism indefinitely. <clears throat> so 
Trump's economic nationalism is really just the recognition that capitalist globalization has reached its limits and that it's every imperialist uh, for himself. So, Carmen, this is a huge topic. There's a lot more that could be said, for example, about Gaza or Ukraine, about the militarization of the U.S.-Mexico border, or about the, the concentration of international capital and how it flows. But suffice it to say that everything is in flux. There are no permanent imperial powers. There are no permanent modes of production. And since foreign policy and domestic policy are so connected, what happens abroad and at home all has a huge effect on mass consciousness. With all the chaos in the world, a, a recent poll found that Americans, uh, only uh, that 40% of American voters want to be isolations, isolationists. Only 17% want active engagement with the world. And only 38% of Americans say that they are extremely proud to be American, which is very different from how it was for, for nearly a century when there was this idea of American exceptionalism, the American dream. And issues like Ukraine and Gaza are live issues in American politics in an election year. Whether it's Biden or Trump, millions of Americans now see evil, only evil, not greater or lesser evil. The all-important question of climate change is also connected to the fight against imperialism because the U.S. military is the number one polluter in the world. It emits more than 50 metric tons of CO2 every year. So if you want to stop climate change or reverse or, you know, stop, reverse this trend, you need to stop the imperialist war machine. And to do that, you need to overthrow capitalism. Now, as revolutionary communists, we're internationalists, of course. We take an interest in, in events worldwide. We offer solidarity to, uh, solidarity to the workers in every struggle. But, but as has been emphasized this week, we should never lose sight of the fact that the main enemy is at home. That's how we stop the war in Gaza by building an organization strong enough to bring down our imperialist governments and take over the economy. In the case of the US, 69% of Israel's arms come from the US, all of it authorized by Congress and the president. And as we've explained in recent articles, the mass action of the working class can not only paralyze the economy, but, uh, but establish a worker's state. And again, the fight is mainly economic, not military. I think sometimes it's, it's hard to wrap your head around just how vast the concentration of capital is. There, there's millions of companies in the United States, but just 500 of them are worth $34 trillion, and they account for 66% of GDP. So by expropriating just 500 companies, an American workers' government would already hold the key levers of the economy in its hands. So in the contest between imperialism and the working class, it's not just about the number of tanks and soldiers in uniform. It's about the class balance of forces, about working class consciousness, confidence, unity, and leadership. But even in the military, soldiers in uniform are, I mean, workers in uniform and soldiers in uniform are, are affected by the generalized crisis and, and, and uh, radicalization. We, we see mutinies and splits along class lines in the military in every single revolution. And, and the reality is that the capitalists don't have enough carrots or enough sticks to keep all of us in line all of the time. I mean, they can't even, uh, they, they don't even have enough ammunition for the Ukrainians, Israelis, and themselves. And we, we know that revolutionary explosions of the class struggle are on the agenda. And if we succeed in building a revolutionary leadership in the next historical period, one country after another will fall to the socialist revolution like dominoes. The, the communists in power will dramatically transform human relations, which will be based on, on genuine cooperation and solidarity between all peoples. These, these bloated military budgets would go instead for, for, for schools and healthcare. All the artificial borders that divide us would be abolished. And the rational planning of the economy on a world scale would allow an incredible quality of life for everybody. So comrades, future generations They'll get to discuss, not the history of the rise and relative decline of US imperialism, but the history of the rise and fall of all imperialisms. And the comrades of the RCI will have played a role in making that history. So to paraphrase the Romans, if you want peace, prepare for war, for class war. Long live the fight against imperialism. No war but the class war, comrades.
In a moment, we'll uh, open up for the discussion. But before we do so, I just want to take a moment to promote a book. This is the latest publication from our publishing house, Well Read. And it's uh, Lenin's writing on imperialist war. And this book, it collects over 400 pages of writings from Lenin on this subject. And it's a really, really great supplement to his classic, Imperialism. We have eight speakers on the list, so I'll have to limit the time that they're able to speak. If they could keep it to under 10 plus, uh, no, five plus five minutes. There were also a few comrades who came up and asked a very good question in the break. A question about this uh, BlackRock financial institution, how they control more than they have in assets. Magic. Yeah, it's magic. So if uh, comrades want to uh, intervene on that, they can do that. And maybe John will deal with some of it in the, in the sum up. The first comrade I'd like to bring in is uh, Adam from the British section, who will be followed by, by uh, Karen from the Mexican section. Adam. Thanks, uh, Victor, and thanks, John, for an excellent lead-off. Um, as John said right at the beginning, one of the key features of imperialism is the concentration of capital and the development of monopolies. <laughs> Lenin lists a number of big monopolies in his time that dominated the economy. Many of these are still household names. Rockefeller and uh, what is now Exxon Mobil, General Electric, Siemens. But I think we can all see that today the modern equivalent is the big tech firms. The 20 biggest tech firms account for over one third of the stock market if you, if you use the uh, S&P 500. And in fact, there's an even higher concentration, just six companies, Apple, Alphabet and Amazon, Microsoft, Meta and Nvidia. These, these firms uh, 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 make up the bulk of this, uh, this, this domination of the stock market. Together they, ha they uh, have asset, the, the stock value is almost 15 trillion dollars. And uh, along with Tesla, which is now a long way behind, they, uh, they account for 28% of the stock market. If you actually look not at this kind of fictitious capital, but actually the actual revenue that companies bring in, you can see the global economy dominated by huge monopolies like Walmart, like Shell and the other oil companies. Also the national oil companies of Saudi Arabia and China, they're some of the biggest companies in the world. And in fact, every single industry and sector is dominated by a handful of monopolies. You have what they call natural monopolies, things like uh, the, the utilities, water and energy, as well as things like the railways, mail, telecommunications. These are all dominated nowadays by big private companies that profiteer. Uh, but monopoly is the same, is, is, the, is the norm in every sector. In, in aeroplane manufacture, you have a duopoly, Boeing and Airbus. If you're into your whiskies and spirits, well, that's a triopoly. Suntory, Diageo, Pernod Ricard. I've never heard of that one myself, personally. What? what? Uh, don't drink enough whiskey. Sorry, I shouldn't shout into the microphone like that. Uh, but big, uh, big Pharma also is obviously well known for being very monopolized, as we saw with the COVID vaccines. And the food industry is particularly concentrated as well. I, I saw one statistic that in the USA, almost 80% of uh, groceries, um, there are just a handful of firms that control over 50% of the market. So it's a lot of statistics. For, for one third of food products, the, these top firms control 75% of the market. And, and these are all big monopolies that control all the big band brands. You know, these, these big companies, they'll be household names, Pepsi, Kraft, Unilever, Nestle. Ten of these big food firms control 80% of retail space in terms of groceries. And what, what Lenin explains is that monopoly isn't just dominating your individual, uh, your, the market that you start in. It also involves what they call vertical and horizontal integration. You try and buy up your suppliers as well as your distributors to control the entire supply chain. You try and spread into adjacent industries. Like today, actually, Amazon makes most of its money off servers, not off uh, selling things on its marketplace. Apple's trying to break into the healthcare sector. Google's talking about developing self-driving cars. And obviously, they try and buy up all the startups and competitors to consolidate their existing markets. But as has been highlighted, it's the finance, the dominance of finance capital that really characterizes imperialism. Today, you have these big hedge funds like Bridgewater and Citadel that control around 200, 300 billion in assets. You have the big investment banks like Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan that control even more, around 3 trillion in assets. But then it's these asset management firms we've heard about that really, they're the big dogs. UBS, Vanguard, they have about 4 and 8 trillion respectively. And then we heard about BlackRock and 10 trillion in assets. 
and that the reason they're able to control a lot more of the economy than just their own assets, Lenin points this out in imperialism, is they, they, they can have, say, a 40% stake in a company, which makes them by far the biggest single owner of shares, and, and therefore gives them control effectively over the decision making in the company. And therefore they have under their control far more assets than actually what they just own. That's part of the explanation. I don't have time to go into the whole of it, unfortunately. But together, the top 10 financial firms hold 45 trillion in assets. To put that in comparison, the whole world's global annual GDP is 100 trillion. So the assets are 45% of world GD annual GDP. Now, Kautsky developed this idea of ultra imperialism. He, he thought that by, by imperialism becoming more concentrated, more dominant, you could actually create stability economically and socially. But in fact, it's the opposite. Extreme monopoly paves the way for bigger crisis, more instability. The, the 2008 crisis was so devastating because of the size of the big banks. Today, the, there's intense speculation on the stock market around these big tech firms and AI, and that's preparing the way for an even bigger slump. And monopoly, extreme monopoly has played a big role in the inflation crisis in recent years. Take this example of semiconductors that John mentioned. Two companies, both based in one Taiwanese city, control 60% of the manufacture of silicon microchips. One company, one Dutch company, controls the technology to help make those uh, uh, machines that, that imprint the chips. And so you see, when you've then got protectionism and pandemics, you're going to get bottlenecks, and they're going to be exacerbated by the concentration of production in one place. Now, the liberals say the solution to this, and libertarians say the solution is to go backwards, to break up the big monopolies. They want more competition, freer markets. But this is completely utopian and reactionary. The Hayekian types, they say that monopoly is unnatural. Hayek says in his, uh, was it, Road to Freedom, that, that actually monopoly is just the result of political decisions, state intervention. But Marx showed it's completely the opposite. It's actually the inner logic of capitalism, of competition and profit, that turns competition into its opposite, into monopoly. And in fact, the fact that the state is constantly intervening to bail out the big banks and the big monopolies shows that there is this tendency towards socialization of production. There, there's a tendency towards socialization in production. And in fact, it's an admission that the productive forces have outgrown the limits of the market of private property. Now, the solution isn't to go backwards and break up these big monopolies. We shouldn't be praising the wonders of small enterprise as uh, kind of uh, greens and left kind of utopians and uh, liberals do. Rather, we should be taking this immense level of planning and organization that exists in these monopolies. There was a, a book published a few years ago called The People's Republic of Walmart, because Walmart, it has a, a, an annual revenue of 600 billion. It, it has a, an, an employee workforce of 2.1 million. It's, 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 it's basically a planned economy internally bigger than what the Soviet Union was. And this is why Lenin says that imperialism is a transitory phase, preparing the conditions for a higher form of society. But this transition won't happen automatically. As long as we've got capitalism, this technology, this planning, this potential is going to be squandered. And instead we see war, climate catastrophe and poverty, the, the, the birth pangs of a new society trying to be born. And it's our job to act as the revolutionary midwife of history. Karen will be followed by Leo from Sweden. Mexico is an economically dependent country in U.S. imperialism. El 82.6 de las exportaciones totales de México van para Estados Unidos. 82.6% of exports go to the U.S. from Mexico. Y somos un país y soberano, Even though we are formally a sovereign and independent country, a los eh, del we are totally succumbed to the interests of um, imperialism. Eh, basta ver cómo eh, México se dio ante la política migratoria de Estados Unidos. It's enough to see how um, Mexico caved into the migration policies of the U.S. O cómo se aceptaron los términos eh, desfavorables para México del Tratado de Libre Comercio. Or how these um, unfair um, terms for this agreement of free um, trade were taken by Mexico. Eh, vemos también cómo la nueva eh, presidenta eh, electa. We also see how the new president-elect. 
eh, tiene que salir a dar eh, declaraciones de que no va a modificar la política fiscal has to come out to clarify that she won't mess with the um, financial policy para que el peso y la bolsa mexicana de valores no se desplomen. So that the peso and the Mexican stock market doesn't lose its value. Y eso corresponde a la definición eh, de un país eh, semicolonial como lo indicó Lenin. This corresponds to the definition of a semi-colonial country like that um, Lenin explained. Eh, como analizamos en las eh, perspectivas de nuestro eh, Congreso con la crisis económica de Estados Unidos. Like we analyze in the perspectives document of our Congress with the economic crisis in the U.S. Eh, este ha tendido hacia el protec eh, proteccionismo. This um, has lent towards protectionism. Eh, y se encuentra en una guerra comercial eh, con China en donde México se ve eh, involucrado en esta disputa imperialista. And it's in this trade war with China and now Mexico is involved in this inter-imperialist dispute. Durante el gobierno de eh, Trump se impusieron aranceles a las exportaciones de China. Um, during Trump's government there were taxes for um, Chinese uh, e exports. Eh, y esto causó un incremento de las importaciones de bienes y servicios desde México hacia Estados Unidos. And this caused an increase of exports from Mexico to the U.S. Y eso ha desplazado a China. And this has displaced China. Eh, y ha convertido a México en 2023 como su primer socio comercial. And has turned Mexico in 2023 as its number one um, commercial partner. Eh, esta tendencia ya se vislumbraba. This uh, trend was already kind of showing. Because in 2022, you had an increase of foreign investment from China towards Mexico. En 2022, la inversión extranjera directa de origen chino. In 2022, the direct foreign investment from China to Mexico. Fue de 2,520 millones de dólares. It was... 250 billion, is that English billion? Billion dollars. Um, y, uh, falta mencionar también and I also have to mention el capital chino que sale desde Estados Unidos para invertirse en México. Chinese capital that leaves the US to be invested into Mexico. Y con estas cifras, and with these numbers, México se ha convertido en el tercer mercado de la región con mayor inversión directa de China. Mexico has become the third biggest market with foreign investment from China eh, in the region. Principalmente la inversión eh, de China se ha eh, dirigido hacia la industria manufacturera y automotriz. Uh, mainly the Chinese foreign investment has been directed towards the manufacturing industry. A las baterías de, eh, de litio. Um, to car manufacturing and lithium batteries. Y se está concentrando en financiar eh, infraestructura básica en el país. And it's focusing on constructing basic infrastructure in the country. Eh, y todas estas obras representan eh, empleo para casi eh, 81 mil mexicanos. All these works represent employment for almost 81,000 Mexicans. Y eso ha hecho que China sea el segundo socio comercial más importante de México. And this has made um, China, China become uh, the second biggest partner uh, in Mexico's market. Eh, también China es el país con mayor inversión en proyectos de reubicación de empresas. China is also the biggest with the um, reallocation of businesses. Y representa el 40% de la demanda de nearshoring. And it represents 40% of the demand in nearshoring. Yeah. Um, y esto lo hace para aprovechar los eh, beneficios que brinda eh, México. And it does this to take advantage of the benefits um, of, you know, doing trading in Mexico. Por ejemplo, la cuestión de los salarios. Uh, like wages. Eh, el salario mínimo, eh, bueno, el peor salario mínimo eh, de, la, de una provincia de China. The worst or lowest minimum wage in a province in China. Es de 2.08 dólares por, por hora. Is 2.08 dólares per hour. Mientras que el salario mínimo en México es de... Well, the minimum wage in Mexico is... 1.66 dólares por hora. 1.67 dólares per hour.
Eh, Lenin plantea que los países eh, imperialistas, por un lado, eh, mejoran parcialmente eh, la calidad de vida de la clase trabajadora. Lenin explained that imperialist countries, on one hand, improve the conditions of living of the working class. Y esto genera una eh, disminución de la emigración y un aumento de la inmigración. And these policies lower um, migration outside of the country and increases immigration. Y esto es justo lo que se pretende hacer con las inversiones de China en el sur del país. And this is precisely the intent of foreign investment in China in the south of the country. Y a su vez estos eh, países exportan eh, su capital. And these countries export their capital. Hacia otros países donde puedan tener mayores ganancias monopolistas. To other countries where they can increase their, um, their, monopol their monopolies and their benefits. Y esto se comprueba eh, en dos sentidos. And this is confirmed in two ways. El primero con el aprovechamiento de la mano de obra barata mexicana. First, taking advantage of the cheap labor in Mexico. Y el otro es el uso de México para mantener sus negocios con Estados Unidos, evitando las sanciones eh, económicas por eh, vía del tratado. And secondly, is using Mexico as a way of getting around the economic sanctions that the U.S. has implemented um, through the treaties with Mexico. Eh, todas estas eh, cuestiones a quienes realmente afectan es a la clase trabajadora mexicana. All these um, things, the people who are really affected by it are the Mexican working class. Porque aunque se vea eh, un incremento en eh, el número de empleos ofrecidos, because although there is a rise in employment, sabemos que Estados Unidos está eh, muy cercano a una crisis económica. We know the U.S. is very close to an economic crisis. Y esto va a generar una disminución del de consumo de mercancías en Estados Unidos. And this will decrease the consumption of goods in the U.S. Y si esto sucede, también generará una salida de capitales de China eh, en México. And this will also create a, like, exodus of, um, cap of Chinese capital in Mexico. Entonces, todo esto que, eh, que acabo de explicar, creo que eh, clarifica el rol de China en México. So, all the things I've outlined, I think, clarifies the role of China in Mexico. Que no es el de un amable socio comercial. It's not a nice um, commercial partnership sino que es el de un buitre imperialista. But it's uh, an imperialist vulture. Que se está disputando el mercado mexicano con el imperialismo estadounidense. That is feeding off the mar Mexican market with the imperialist, um, with the U.S. imperialism. Y bueno, quisiera eh, terminar para parafraseando una eh, frase de Fred Hampton. And I want to paraphrase with a quote from Fred Hampton. No se combate el fuego con fuego. You don't fight fire with fire. El fuego se apaga con agua. Fire is put out with water. Y así como no se combate al capitalismo con capitalismo negro. So you can't fight um, capitalism with black capitalism. El imperialismo estadounidense. Uh, U.S. imperialism. No se combate con imperialismo chino. Can't be fought with Chinese imperialism. Al imperialismo se le combate con la revolución comunista internacional. You fight imperialism with international communist revolution. Next speaker is Leo from Sweden, who will be followed by Helena from uh, Yugoslavia. Three weeks after the Ukraine war started, the, an uh, article in the capitalist press in Sweden gave some good advice to, some, to uh, the main arms manufacturer in Sweden, Saab. They said, now is, the, now is a golden opportunity to raise prices. This was how they saw the war, death, the, the uh, destruction, a golden opportunity to increase prices. And they continue that an exciting option for Saab is a Swedish NATO membership. It will open up uh, markets for the company and make it much more easy to sell. This option is now reality. But the Swedish NATO membership is about much more than uh, good uh, profits for, for, for the arms industry. It's a way to defend the interest of, of, the, of uh, Swedish finance uh, capital and, that, and as a tool to expand it further. The restoration of uh, capitalism in the, in the Soviet uh, Union and the weakness of uh, Russian uh, capitalism made the former Baltic Soviet uh, states a uh, prime uh, market for the Swedish expansion. Today, two Swedish banks control between 50 and 60 percent of the banking sector in all three countries, and uh, Swedish companies dominate the telecom industry.
Sweden accounts for the largest share of uh, foreign direct investment in Latvia. And uh, now, with uh, Russia expanding its uh, sphere of influence or looking to, to do so, um, Sweden it look, needs to uh, protect them. But uh, Sweden is uh, too weak in imperialist power. So to uh, conquer markets, they need to depend on other stronger imperialist powers. Therefore, uh, Swedish NATO membership has been on the wish list of the Swedish bourgeoisie for a long time. But having built up a rep reputation of uh, new neutrality uh, over the uh, decades, this was uh, politically impossible. But this changed with the outbreak of the Ukraine war. As in many uh, countries, the, bur the bourgeois media and uh, politicians uh, launched an ear-deafening campaign, and it worked. The support grew from 29% uh, percent to 64 percent overnight. They launched all type of uh, stories about an imminent Russian invasion and said that the most dangerous period was, be, was uh, be, be, uh, between applying for membership and actually becoming a member. So it was very important that this process was very, very fast. Now we know that this was a complete fantasy. The real reason was to uh, protect their investments, these markets, uh, that is the right to exploit the uh, Baltic masses. And now as our first NATO mission, we will send one battalion of soldiers to uh, Latvia by next year. They also hope to get a seat at the uh, NATO uh, table to try to keep the focus in the Baltic uh, Sea and against uh, Russia, rather than shifting the focus to China. I have to skip uh, forward, but uh, this uh, was... Uh, um, this uh, tested all the parties and tendencies in, in Sweden. And uh, everyone capitulated in a spectacular fashion. First out, social uh, dem democrats uh, adapted immediately and sent in the application themselves. The left uh, uh, party also crumbled. They uh, said that uh, there is right and there is left, but when it comes to uh, Swedish defense, it's all of us together. <laughs> The de facto paper, uh, party uh, paper, The Flame, said social, that uh, socialists should uh, develop a foreign policy in line with NATO. What the Swedish workers' movement need is the ideas of Lenin. And it's um, um, symptomatic that uh, Lenin's book on imperialism has not been available in Sweden for decades. We need a real understanding of what imperialism is and a program to fight it. Not for leaving NATO, but for destroying it. So we are trying to rectify this. Yeah. Now, Lenin's imperialism is in, is in uh, Sweden as of three months ago or so. But we can't stop there. We have also founded a party, a Leninist party, to take these, these ideas into the schools, universities, neighborhoods and workplaces. Now uh, Helena will speak, followed by uh, Ture from Germany. So hello comrades. As you all know, Yugoslavia doesn't really exist. So many comrades here asked us, uh, why do we have a Yugoslav section? And I'm going to try to answer this question among others. For the past 1,500 years, Balkans, the Balkans have been divided between several imperialist forces. There's a sentence from Dmitry Tutsovich, he was an old Yugoslav communist. And it says that the Balkans suffer from too many borders. This is true today as it was 100 years ago. So anyone who ever traveled around the Balkans have seen that this is an area with different cultures, different languages, and a strong local chauvinism. This is because of the late formation of the nation state in the Balkans. The Balkans were teared apart by very weak imperialist forces, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. And this led to the Balkan Wars in 1912. Imperialist forces, Great Britain, France and Russia, wanted to spread their influence into the Balkans. So they used our nations, well, our small nations, uh, they made us fight against each other. However, after the First Balkan War, Bulgaria was not satisfied with the spoils, how it was divided in the Balkans. And in 1913, there was already a second Balkan War that caused great casualties, especially in Macedonia. 
All these tensions between the different imperialist forces actually led to the World War, to the First World War. The direct cause of First World War was actually the assassination of Ferdinand from Austro-Hungarian Empire. But that was because the Austro-Hungarian Empire decided to annex Bosnia in order to not allow Serbia spread to the sea. However, they lost in World War I and Austro-Hungarian Empire, Empire fall apart. So this was the first time in our history that the Slavic nations united, the South Slavic nations, and we formed the kingdom of the Croats, the Serbs, and the Slovenes, which was later renamed to Kingdom of Yugoslavia. So in the same way that the First World War started because Germany wanted uh, to spread their influence, the Second World, start, the Second World War started from, because of the same thing. We were occupied by the Nazis in World War II. In the beginning of the war, we tried this method of popular frontism. We have a strong base in the communist movement since the 1920s. But unfortunately, and fortunately, this popular frontism tactics didn't really work in Yugoslavia. So what happened is actually that the, uh, the Communist Party of Yugoslavia made way through a socialist revolution. So despite the Stalinist leadership and the mistakes afterwards, because the situation in Yugoslavia is the same as in the Soviet Union, Trotsky says in Revolution Betrayed that the party bureaucracy will eventually want to restore capitalism. So they did this, eventually. But also there was a strong influence of the imperialist forces that really hated the socialist Yugoslavia and wanted to destroy it from the moment that it was created. But regardless of everything, the partisan movement was the most progressive phenomenon ever seen in the Balkans. In just a few years, and I'm talking about a decade, uh, parts of Yugoslavia made the transition from a feudal structure to a relatively advanced industrial force. So we are very proud of this history. However, the Germans intervened again in the 90s. So can you imagine this situation that there is a bank in Austria, Hippo Alpe Adria Bank? Hippo Alpe Adria. This bank went bankrupt because they were financing the war in Yugoslavia. The Western imperialist forces were building up Croatian nationalism especially. And Miroslav Tuđman, the Croatian dictator in the 90s, used the Lenin right of self-determination to split away Croatia from the rest of the Yugoslavia. So actually what happened in Yugoslavia in the 90s is a direct cause of the intervenance of the imperialist forces. And more than anything else, it was a class war, actually. And not only that, but because Yugoslavia is in Europe, the war had to be brutal in order to show that to everyone that socialism is not possible. So today, 2024, from Yugoslavia, we have seven extremely small, dwarf, very weak statelets. And the situation is pretty much the same. We are severed between different imperialist forces. So the situation in Yugoslavia today, but not only Yugoslavia, all of the Balkans, is the direct effect of imperialism. Western imperialism created this situation. And this is why today we have a Yugoslav section. So I would like to finish with a quote from Dmitry Tutsovic again. But before the quote, I'll say one more thing. Sorry. <laughs> so the only solution for the Balkans is actually a socialist revolution in a context of a broader world socialist revolution, European revolution. And now it's the quote. The Balkans, without small states and artificially drawn borders, without fratricidal wars, freed from the rule of the big European capitalists, a free and independent... Ah, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, so the Balkans, without small states and artificially drawn borders, without fratricidal wars, freed from the rule of the big European capitalists, a free and independent, a united Balkan Republic, a developed Balkan at a high level of cultural, technological, and scientific development, and a Balkan that will not belong to the rule of the kings, but only to socialism. Tour from Germany will be followed by Jordi from the UK.
So, comrades, when we discuss the historical role of capitalism, we often emphasize its historical progressive role which it played in history. But we also maintain that it has lost this role a long time ago, which is why Lenin called imperialism uh, the stage of capitalism in decay. And many people might ask, how can this be true um, if capitalism actually still developed the productive forces uh, after, after it has lost its pr progressive role? And I think a good topic to uh, explain it is uh, the topic of colonialism. Because I think for many radicalizing people, colonialism uh, still shows them uh, very obviously how capitalism lost its progressive role and also the complete moral bankruptcy capitalism has today. And contrary to the beliefs some post-colonials might have, Marxists took the question very seriously very early on. In 1882, Engels and Kautsky discussed the uh, question. And uh, Engels explained that the countries uh, inhabited by native population but, um, but oppressed by European countries should be taken over by the proletariat for a short time and led as rapidly towards independence. He further said, uh, India will perhaps indeed very probably make a revolution. And as a proletariat in process of self-emancipation cannot conduct any colonial wars, The same might also take place everywhere in Algeria and Egypt and would certainly be the best thing for us. He further emphasized, um, rejected the idea that uh, the colonies and underdeveloped countries have to, have to necessarily um, uh, go th through the uh, stage of capitalism and instead can be developed by the proletariat in the socialist countries. So the upholders of identity politics criticize us for our uh, one-sided uh, economic view of history But I think our debate with the forefathers, the revisionists in social democracy, shows uh, that our view is a dialectical view and not a one-sided view. In uh, 1907, there was a debate at the Socialist Congress of the Second International in Stuttgart um, what position the socialists took take towards colonialism. Um, the, rev the revisionists, which were headed by people like Van Kohl, who was a Dutch uh, socialist, or Bernstein from the German social democracy, came in an argument with uh, people like Lenin, Luxembourg, and also Kautsky at the time. They had in the Congress some sort of commission which put forward a resolution uh, for a position towards colonialism. And in their resolution, the revisionists say, taking into consideration that socialism will develop the productive forces, of the whole world and will raise all people to the highest level of culture, Congress does not reject all colonial policy in principle because it could have a civilizing effect under socialism. So the revisionists based their critic on colonialism at best on some uh, moral points about the um, brutal behavior of the colonizers, but, th but they didn't actually seem to have uh, too, too much of a problem with it. Because at the same Congress, uh, Bernstein declared that Civilized people have to exercise a certain guardianship over uncivilized people. Van Gogh, the uh, Dutch uh, social democrat I talked about, actually said that we have to go there arms in hand even if Kautsky calls this imperialism. They had a very abstract, run-sided way of uh, talking about the development of the productive forces and simply repeated that the colonies must pass through capitalism. Um, while the bourgeoisie, instead of developing the productive forces, was actually implementing slavery in some of the colonies. Lenin commented on the Congress that it strikingly showed up socialist opportunism, which succumbs to bourgeois uh, blandishments. Uh, yeah. um, which succumbs to bourgeois blandishments. So, uh, the person who was mainly uh, giving off the fight against the revisionists was Kautsky at the time, who in his uh, small book, Socialism and Colonial Policy, which Lenin ironically later used against Kautsky's theory of ultra-imperialism, gives a very good of the um, limits of the, productive, of, the, of the development of the productive forces in capitalism and in colonialism. Because um, at the time it was uh, shown ra rapidly that there wasn't any development. The productive forces were stagnating since the 1880s. There was not, not huge productive development. The nations raised their tariffs and... The colonies only made up for 6% of world economy, of which 4% belonged to India. Um, the colonies only made up 4%, uh, 6% of the world economy, of the world market, and 4% of that belonged to India. The peasants, uh, um, uh, famines were created due to the pressure of the international market, 
because peasants had to compete there with a very, very bad labor equipment, while many colonies were unprofitable and were basically used for artificial demand and for militarism. But Kautsky didn't have a clear perspective of how to undergo colonial liberation. This was only done by the Communist International, which analyzed that the resistance in the colonized countries was growing and growing. The, bu the bourgeoisie was commencing genocides. Um, and uh, they talked about that we support the colonial fights of liberation of all people in those countries, but emphasized that those struggles must be connected to the Soviet system and by the help of the proletariat must, uh, um, must develop towards socialism uh, when they take power in their own countries. So to give like a few last sentences, I th think we can see very clearly that um, capitalism couldn't, uh, until this day, couldn't industrialize the colonial world, and more than ever, the socialist revolution in the colonial countries and the whole world must be, uh, must be on the plan. Thank you, comrades. Take Jody from the British section, followed by a short intervention by Karim from Pakistan. Yes, first of all, <clears throat> I'd like to say that uh, I thought John's intervention uh, introduction was excellent, and it covered uh, a massive amount of different uh, questions in a short space of time. Now, if you, if you read Lenin's Imperialism, which I strongly recommend, you will see how what he describes is very, very similar to what we have today. In fact, if, if anything, the process has gone uh, even further, the process of concentration of capital, domination of imperialism. But really, we also need to look at Lenin's method in developing his theory of imperialism. This, this was at the time a new question. And uh, Lenin used the Marxist method, which starts which starts with a concrete analysis of the facts. In uh, Lenin's Collected Works, there is a volume that contains Lenin's notebooks on imperialism, and it shows that in order, in order to write uh, imperialism, Lenin sat for weeks on end at a library in Switzerland, and he read, and he read everything that was there to, re to be read about imperialism. He read what uh, the bourgeois was saying about imperialism. He read what other socialists or Marxists had said about imperialism. And he also accumulated a mass of facts and figures that he then tried to analyze. These uh, notebooks on imperialism go on for about 800 pages and contain extracts from 148 different books. 100 in German, 23 in French, 17 in English, two Russian translations. 232 articles and 49 periodical publications. This, this is the Marxist, Marxist method starts from the facts, but it doesn't stop at the facts, obviously. It then tries to draw general conclusions from these facts. And this is how we also should proceed when we analyze new phenomena. Like, for instance, the rise of China as an imperialist power. Now, um, Adam gave a few, uh, some figures about the question of the concentration of capital. Uh, I think that's one of the most um, uh, astonishing, astonishing facts of modern-day imperialism. In 2011, some uh, Swiss researchers elaborated a report in which they looked at 43,000 multinational companies and worked out their internal relationships, i.e. which ones were invested in which others, how much they controlled of each other, and so on. And they determined that amongst these uh, 43,000 multinational companies, 147 controlled 40% controlled of the world's wealth. 40%. And 737 controlled 80%. Now, it's a, they, and they worked this out into a, a model a graphic model, which is really cool to see with, with uh, red dots and blue dots. And, uh, yeah. it's, really, it's really very graphically expressed. But you can see, as Adam said, you can see that in every single um, uh, sector of the economy. Take, for instance, pharmaceutical. There is one giant pharmaceutical company, which is called GSK. And GSK stands for Glaxo, Smith, Klein, and Beecham which gives you a clue, Glaxo, Smith, Klein, and Beecham. Smith, Klein, and Beecham. 
which gives you a clue that this is, this is a company that is the result of the fusion of two companies, Glaxo and Wellcom and Smith, Klein and Beecham. Uh, Glaxo and Wellcom is the result of a fusion of two companies, Glaxo and Wellcom. Smith, Klein and Beecham is the fusion of two companies, Beecham and Smith, Klein and uh, Beckham, which in turn, and so on. So you see, not only the concentration of capital, but the tendency towards monopolization, the, the hostile takeovers, the fusion and merger of companies. Uh, Stellantis, which is one of the largest uh, car companies in the world, is the result of the fusion of Fiat Chrysler and the PSA group. Fiat Chrysler, Chrysler is, the, is the result of the fusion of Fiat and Chrysler, or the takeover of Fiat by Chrysler. And the PSA group is the fusion of a whole number of uh, car companies and takeovers, Peugeot, Citroën, Opel, Vauxhall, etc. Citroën. And you can see this in every sector. There's, a, there's now also an alliance that involves uh, Renault, Nissan, and Mitsubishi. Uh, Adam mentioned this uh, BYD, uh, the car company, the Chinese car company. But BYD relies on batteries that are made by CATL. CATL is a Chinese company that controls 34% of the world's uh, manufacturing of uh, batteries for electric vehicles. One company. And this company is a very good example of, of what Adam was, was talking about, that's in, in uh, Lenin's imperialism, of vertical integration. This company controls the, the cobalt mines in uh, Congo, controls the process for refining uh, the cobalt, uh, controls the whole, the whole process of the production, and this is, this is why it's been able to corner this, this massive amount of the world market. Uh, Adam also mentioned another company called uh, ASML, <clears throat> ASML is a Dutch company that makes the machines that print semiconductors. And this is an extreme example of the increase in the organic composition of capital. This uh, company, based in uh, Holland, makes machines that print semiconductors. And one of these machines is as, as big as this uh, building, I guess this room and costs 380 million euro, one machine. This is the latest, the latest version of this uh, machine, which is called uh, uh, a high number aperture extreme ultraviolet uh, lithography machine. <laughs> the Alta Apertura Numerica. Uh, and, and this brings me to another point. Th this uh, massive domination of uh, one company over the world market also means and now the U.S. has strong-armed the Dutch government in order to impose sanctions so that this latest version of the lithography machine cannot be exported to China. <clears throat> and this shows you another thing. Uh, this is imperialism, isn't it? It's supposed to be a free market. It is in the interest of ASML and presumably the Dutch government to export uh, these machines to its biggest uh, market, but the United States is doing that in order, in order, is preventing that in order to do what? In order uh, to defend the interests of U.S.-based or U.S.-allied companies. I, all those people that say that imperialism doesn't exist, that the companies are transnational, not multinational, but trans, they don't have a national base, like like Hart and Negri argued in 2001 in, in a new updated version of Kautsky's ultra-imperialism, they, uh, they are proven wrong in practice. When there is a conflict between uh, Airbus and Boeing, the U.S. government defends the interest of the U.S. company. And the president of France, the president of France, Macron, travels to China to make sure that the Chinese, uh, which is now the, gro the fastest growing market for commercial aircraft are buying Airbus uh, planes and not uh, Boeing planes. Imperialism, imperialism has a clear national base and this is what leads to conflicts between different imperialist powers and imperialist blocs. The final point I wanted to make is, yes, China has risen to become uh, an imperialist power as, as we have explained and, and John has explained in his lead-off. But we should uh, shy away from the idea that 
the US is a declining power and China is a rising power and at some point China will overtake uh, the US because China is also because China is also coming up against its own limits in its development which I don't have time to explain but, but some of them are related to overproduction and uh, so on uh, the, the 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 limits of the world market but one very important uh, uh, limit to the development of China as an imperialist country is that in the last 30 years, we have seen the development of a massive proletariat in China. Most of these are first generation workers coming straight from the countryside into the most modern machines, uh, uh, to, to work with the most modern machines in the world. In huge factories like Foxconn, where a hundred, over 100,000 workers work under the same roof and live together. And, uh, and, and uh, the only historical parallel that uh, occurs to me in relation to this is the period leading up to the Russian Revolution in 1917. And the same processes are going on in China today. Well, comrades, I have to uh, cut off the discussion here. I'm sorry to Karim and to Joe, who I uh, couldn't bring in. And okay, you have time? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, if Karim wants to come up and, uh, and give a short, short contribution, he can do so. Well, thank you, comrades. Uh, due to short time, I will discuss only the uh, U.S. imperialism role in Afghanistan, which he played from last 20 years. And one point... Perhaps all comrades will agree that U.S. imperialism has always played a reactionary role since its emergence. Uh, just before the 1978 revolution in Afghanistan, U.S. imperialism began the process of creating religious fundamentalists to form a front against the USSR under the Cold War, in which his puppet state of, uh, uh, like Pakistan was not, fully, uh, not only supported but uh, they took billions of dollars in return for this imperial service. And this process continued with various ups and downs until Trump, uh, Trump came to power in the uh, US uh, in 2016. Uh, the situation that happened after the revolutionary changes in Afghanistan in 1978 can be debated. Can be debated. But as a Marxist communist, we unconditionally support that event in Afghanistan. With the revolution of 1978, the imperialist project known as Petro-Dollar Jihad began. Uh, and in this context, fundamentalism was laid in the Pashtun populated areas of Pakistan adjacent to the Afghanistan. Uh, if we describe the imperialist project in Afghanistan in detail, it will become a separate session for itself. However, I will try to keep it uh, in brief context in the, uh, of the US imperialism Cold War with the Soviet Union and also starting a revolution inside Afghanistan. However, I will try to keep it brief uh, in the context of U.S. imperialism, uh, uh, Cold War with the Soviet Union, and also distorting a revolution inside Afghanistan. Uh, the repercussions of the U.S. imperialist project in Afghanistan were the destruction of the overall society and laid the, laid the foundations of the religious fundamentalism over there. Apart from this, all immoral and anti-human activities started in Afghanistan, including drug trafficking, human trafficking, and a lot, a long list of other crimes. Although the Afghan Saur revolution had to be transformed into counter-revolutionary forces due to its internal and external challenges, but in this context, the imperialist tyrants that have been created by the U.S. imperialism killed millions of people and also a huge number of immigrants. In short, Afghanistan. Uh, in short, Afghanistan in general and Pashtun societies in particular were pushed to the uh, Stone Age. And by placing the terrorist groups created by the U.S. imperialism in power in 1996, the U.S. imperialism temporarily fled from Afghanistan uh, and left the region. While leaving Afghanistan at the mercy of its imperialist touts, uh, that is the Taliban uh, and Pakistan, who trample all human values, uh, values through their barbaric laws. In 2001, U.S. imperialism once again turned to Afghanistan on the basis of the so-called war on terror, which John also mentioned. And the so-called war on terror, U.S. imperialism removes its own religious terrorist puppets from power and replaced them with its liberal, uh, liberal representatives. The discussion regarding the elimination of the Taliban is clearly present in our organization's article published uh, on Marxist.com in 2005.
and only two decades have passed since the return of the Taliban on 15th of August 2021. The U.S. imperialism once again handed over the power to the Taliban under the Doha Agreement. Billions of dollars made by American and European working people's taxes were poured into Afghanistan. But still, the Afghanistan in the hands of the Taliban and there are there is no life under the Taliban. Uh, so what I have to um, conclude my point is class struggle has fully surfaced in the whole world, including Pakistan, Afghanistan at this time. And, here, uh, and there is a need to fight against all these imperialist ambitions under a correct line of action. And we appeal to all the students, youth and workers in Pakistan and around the globe that come in, uh, and be a part of this struggle under the banner of RCI so that we can eradicate this inhuman society and create a human society. Thank you. Thank you to Kareem. I'll now bring in John to, uh, to sum up. Well, comrades, I think it's been an excellent uh, discussion. I think it's obvious we could go on for many hours, even days, just to examine uh, various uh, angles of this question. Adam mentioned companies like UBS, Vanguard, and BlackRock. And by, by one estimate, the financial services sector accounts for about 20 to 25% of the world economy. And this includes banking, lending, insurance, and investment companies, which other industries depend on for loans and for credit. And for more, more detail uh, on this, this waterfalling of economic control, you can go to chapter two of Lenin's imperialism called The Banks and Their New Role. And just to quote a, a little bit from it, he explains that the big enterprises and the banks in particular not only completely absorb the small ones, but also annex them, subordinate them, bring them into their own group or concern by acquiring holdings in their capital, by purchasing or exchanging shares, by a system of credits, etc. <clears throat> he says, Deutsche Bank Group is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, of the big banking groups. In order to trace the main threads which connect all the banks of this group, a distinction must be made between holdings of the first and second and third degree, or what amounts to the same thing, between dependents of these banks in the first, second, and third degree on Deutsche Bank. And, and he had these nice little charts that illustrate it very concretely. And he concludes, altogether Deutsche Bank Group comprises directly, indirectly, partially, and totally 87 banks, and the total capital its own, and that of the others which it controls, is estimated at between two and 3,000 million marks. So far more than Deutsche Bank itself is actually worth. Jordi gave some other examples of this uh, in the modern world. <clears throat> Here's another one. Uh, there's 4,500 banks in the United States. But of those, just 10 of them control over 50% of the assets. And through their subsidiary connections, they basically control all of it. So you might go down to your little hometown bank in the middle of nowhere, but it's ultimately connected to Chase, Manhattan, or Citibank, or, or some, some other big company. But it's, it's not just these companies that sort of control each other. You can narrow it down to, to individual capitalists and CEOs. I mentioned, the, I mentioned the Fortune 500. And on those 500 companies, there's about 5,400 uh, seats on the boards. But just about 700 individuals control 30% of all those seats. So, so they sit on multiple companies' boards. So, I mean, that's monopoly capital personified. And of course, there's a rapidly revolving uh, door between government service and the private sector. Think tanks, lobbyists. Every new administration appoints all these new ministers, and they, most of them come from big companies. And then they go back to the private sector, and then they come back. I mean, it's, the capitalists also have another uh, saying, which is never let a good crisis go to waste. And every crisis is used to accelerate this concentration of capital, including in banking. <clears throat> and as COVID was sort of 
unfolding in slow motion on TV those early months of, of 2020. I, I remember this press conference where Trump was talking about this huge bailout and everybody's in shock and, and scared. And you could see before your very eyes this massive transfer of, 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 of capital, of wealth and, and further accumulation. And so between 2019 and 2021, so just at the beginning of the pandemic, that first part of the pandemic, the assets of the U.S. banks grew by $4 trillion. By, by the end of 2022, U.S. banks had over $22 trillion in assets, which was up 32% from a decade earlier, adjusted for inflation. Then there are the, the, also these so-called non-bank financial institutions, and these are things like pension funds, mutual funds, hedge funds. And, and, and worldwide, in 2021, these non-banks who loan money and borrow money, just like any other bank, they had $239 trillion in assets on their books, which is about 49% of the, of the total worldwide. And so you have these shadow banks, and, and they're basically exactly like banks, except there's, they're not regulated, and they account for about 14% of the world's financial assets. So that's a, a slight potential instability for the system, where you can have, uh, you know, runs on, on non-banks. Um, Karen, I thought, uh, raised a lot of good points about U.S. and Chinese imperialism in relation to Mexico, and, and this idea that th there is no lesser evil when it comes to imperialism. And the point about Swedish imperialism, that Leo raised, I mean, how even relatively small powers can have an imperialist policy in their near abroad, as they say. I mean, Sweden's only the 23rd largest country by GDP, and yet it clearly has an imperialist policy. Uh, as Elena explained, d during the Balkan Wars at the beginning of the 20th century, even countries like Bulgaria counted as imperialist, at least if you, if you believe what Leon Trotsky says. And he, he wrote at the time, Bulgarian imperialism is of recent origin, but is all the more bellicose and reckless for that. The Bulgarian bourgeoisie came late on the scene, and at once began vigorously using its elbows in order to get ahead. Now, in 1912, Bulgaria had about 4.4 million people. So how much more vigorous with its elbows can a country of 1.4 billion people be today? A country like China. So many comments, there's, there's lots to this subject. There's lots to think about, lots to analyze and to absorb. But as the great revolutionary communist and, and martyr of the anti-imperialist struggle against British imperialism in India, Bhagat Singh, he said, bombs and pistols don't make a revolution. The sword of revolution is sharpened on the wedding stone of ideas. So let's keep synthesizing the facts, sharpening our main weapon, the ideas, our theory, the Marxist method, as we prepare for the overthrow of capitalism and imperialism on a world scale in our lifetime. Thank you, comrades.